Welcome everybody tonight to our third session of Theological Insights. This is, uh, this is a program that's presented um, by the congregation and it spotlights um, young folks in the community who are studying theology and wanna share their ideas with us. Tonight, we get to hear from Sierra Curry Kilpatrick. Sierra was a St. Joseph worker in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 2018 and 2019. She's currently a second year Master of Divinity student at Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. She has interests in interreligious dialogue and young adult middle ministry, which is what she's talking about tonight. She's also in the middle of finals week there. She just turned in a paper today. She's got more due later this week. So as she speaks with us tonight, you can send some prayers her way as she works to finish her semester and um, has still agreed to give us this wonderful time tonight, even though that she's in the middle of her schoolwork. So thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we're so glad you're here. Thank you so much. So Sierra's talk is titled, How to Find a Spiritual Horizon, Understanding and Ministering to Young Adults in Our Stormy World. Sierra, why don't you unmute yourself and begin? Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's uh, good evening, everyone. It's, it's such a pleasure to be with all of you via Zoom tonight. Um, it's always such a joy for me to spend time with this community. Um, and I'm honored to share just a little bit of what I've been learning and studying this semester at Boston College um, School of Theology and Ministry. And I'm happy to share it with all of you, um, the CSJ community, sisters, consociates, friends. Um, if it weren't for a lot of you here, I probably would not be where I am today. So thank you very much. Um, I'll begin our time together by sharing an opening prayer. Um, then I'll offer my presentation and then I'll offer some questions for us to ponder um, while we have time in some small discussion groups, which will be explained later. Um, and then we'll have a chance to come back together as a large group for more questions and insights um, that we'd like to share with one another, um, as Andrea has explained to us. Um, so let us begin in prayer. Let us remember that we're in the holy presence of God and may we always remember to love God and the dear neighbor without distinction. Good and gracious God, thank you for the gift of life, for the journey of discovering who we are and who we're meant to be for others. But God, we live in a stormy world. Navigating these waters are challenging. Help us to be a beacon a guiding light for the young person beside us on our journey. May we embrace each of our gifts and talents, finding our role, our purpose, as together we navigate our way to the horizon that we can call our home. We ask this all in your name, amen. So today we're gonna be talking about young people. Um, Maybe some of you work with or minister um, or teach young people, teenagers, young adults. Uh, maybe you still are a young adult like me, technically. Uh, maybe you aren't, but maybe you're a mentor, you're an aunt, an uncle, a parent, a godparent. Either way, I hope we can all learn a little bit more today about the young people in our lives, how we can best minister to them and maybe learn a little bit more about ourselves too, because I think we're all still growing up. <laughs> so most of what I'm gonna be sharing with you today is uh, just some of the plenty of things I've learned from my practice of ministry with youth and young adults um, course this semester. Um, my professor, Teresa O'Keefe, um, who took the pleasure of joining us tonight, so welcome. Um, shares excellent insights, not only theologically, but practically when it comes to ministering to young folks. Um, so I don't know about you, uh, but for me, theology uh, can sometimes be too much up here in our head and not right here in our heart or right here. Um, people aren't in front of us, um, but maybe that's just because I'm in 
the middle of an intense Master of Divinity program at Boston College. Um, but just want us to remember that this isn't only about God, but it is also about God, uh, about us, for God is with us. God is Emmanuel, as we're reminded this Advent season. Um, so in a sense, I believe it's important for theology to be Trinitarian in the fact that it needs to be focused on relationship with God, with others, and with ourselves for it to really start making sense. Um, and I think this is how Professor O'Keefe frames ministry with adolescents. So I'm going to start our PowerPoint, share the screen. Okay, okay, okay. Everyone can see it okay? Can Andrea give me a thumbs up? Great. So Professor O'Keefe names four tasks for adolescents um, as they're navigating toward adulthood. Uh, the first is to be able to see self as person, um, to re recognize your own personhood. Uh, the second is being able to see others as persons. So the people around us being able to know and recognize their personhood. And then third, we need to recognize our relationship with these persons. Um, and lastly, the fourth task is we need to be able to help adolescents. Um, they need to figure out for themselves how to interpret and discover their place in the world. So in this course I'm taking, uh, O'Keefe has been using the metaphor of sailing to describe the process of becoming an adult and to help us understand these tasks um, that adolescence is asking of these young folks as they're moving towards adulthood. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm gonna take you through a quick little meditation. Um, on the PowerPoint, you should see uh, a boat on the water. Um, that is my kayak on a night, uh, Onondaga Lake um, in Syracuse, New York. Um, so I want you to pretend you're on this boat. Imagine yourself on a boat. Uh, but not just a solo kayak, not just by yourself, but maybe a tandem kayak, a canoe, a sailboat, a boat that requires a lot of people to, to guide it through the water. And I want you to imagine the water as the world. Imagine what it takes to paddle or to sail through that water. What do you need to do that? One, you need to realize what is your role on the boat? Who are you? What are you doing? What are your skills and your tasks as you're navigating this boat? Second, you need to have a good relationship with your um, crew members, your partners. Um, you need to know what their tasks are um, and how to work with them, how to work together um, with your tasks to move the boat forward. And then third, you need to know how to navigate these waters. Um, you need to understand the weather patterns, uh, navigation skills, direction. You need to know how to use the paddle, know how to use the sail if you're on a sailboat. And you need to know techniques um, to move you through rough waters especially. Um, and lastly, you need a destination on the horizon to sail towards, to paddle towards. You need some sort of reason, purpose, meaning. Um, so this is what we need to do in a sense, um, to live and to be adults in the world. It's, no small task. So what a relief we're able to do it together as a community. And what a blessing that uh, many of us have rich traditions to guide us. So what does it take? Um, how do we help young people find their horizon on these rough waters? Um, we live in a stormy world today, as I'm sure many of you recognize, there's a lot going on. Um, so here's an outline of um, what I'm gonna be talking through um, with um, to help us figure that out, how we're gonna help the um, young folks find that horizon. Uh, first, we're gonna look at the self um, in detail. We're uh, gonna see what's going on in that self that is the adolescent. Then we're gonna briefly look at the world, think about what's going on in our culture, um, what's influencing young folks. Then we're gonna look at the community. Um, how can the communities that they're a part of 
help them? How do they shape them? What do communities offer? What do our traditions in our communities offer? So first, we're going to look at the self that is the adolescent and understand that self. Um, so I thought we'd dive right into the brain. Um, and I hope I'm not the first person to tell you that human brains are fascinating, um, especially what goes on in the brain during adolescence. There's as much going on in the adolescent brain as there, in, in the, there is in the first years of your life. Um, there's a period of intense growth and reorganization that's happening. Um, and this is going on from anywhere about age 10 to all the way to your mid 20s. Um, it's a period of heightened neuroplasticity. Um, and what that big word means is uh, neural pathways are being formed as skills are being learned. The brain is literally reorganizing, um, reshaping, reconnecting um, neural pathways. Um, and this is all mostly going on in the prefrontal cortex, um, which means there's a lot of growth and reshaping um, going on in what is our decision maker, what's gonna be our CEO of the brain, if you will. Um, so a lot to do with decision making, um, a lot to do with trying new things. Um, and all this going on is part of the reason why um, adolescent, adolescents, teenagers, young adults are so impulsive and risky um, because there's an eagerness to try new things. The brain wants um, young people to try new things, to learn new things, to gain these skills. Um, but it's also why it's kind of um, a risky time uh, because the decision-making building is still happening in the front part of the brain. Um, so young people are not able to have the maturity of judgment um, as uh, older adults are. Um, they can't think about their consequences. Um, but yet this risky part of life is also a period of incredible opportunity um, for the plasticity of the adolescent brain is so much more than the adult brain. There's so much more reorganization going on. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the term, the phrase, use it or lose it. Um, so it's why learning things as an adult is a lot harder um, because um, our brain isn't wired to, to hold on to these skills um, in the same way as the adolescent is. Um, they're literally wired to reorganize, learn, and formulate ways of thinking that'll stay with them for the rest of their life if it's practiced enough. And um, if it's practiced and done, they'll keep it in their brain. So keeping all this mind in mind, pun totally intended, um, it becomes a little easier to understand how adolescents and young adults are able to develop their thinking beyond themselves with concepts, with relationships to others, to the world. Um, this is because there's, there's a shift going on in their thinking, um, thinking about doing concrete things, um, shifting to uh, thinking about the concepts behind these concrete things. Um, this is explained in something called subject-object theory. Um, which is, comes from Robert Keegan, um, which is very complex for my brain. Um, so I'm gonna, here's what I want you to take away from it. Um, if you'll see on the PowerPoint um, is a, some concentric circles um, that my professor drew for us, um, explaining to us um, uh, orders of thinking. Um, so here, we have on the, the outside, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but hopefully you can. Um, great. So on the outside, um, this is where the understanding of the ultimate, um, that horizon we're all moving towards. Um, and within 
these circles are different ways, different levels of knowing um, that grow and develop from childhood to adulthood. Um, second order, third order, and fourth order knowing. Um, so if you can still follow my cursor, uh, most younger adolescents start here in the center um, between seven to 11 years of age. So they're able to do the concrete things. Um, they can follow the rules, um, hopefully sometimes. Um, they can learn right and wrong actions. They can learn the steps to worship, to prayer. Um, they can tell stories. Um, they know how stories are told. Um, and then, so this is second order thinking. And then moving towards third order thinking, they're starting to connect these concretes. Um, they start to know that there is meaning in the stories. Um, there are values in those stories. Um, there's reasons why behind the rules. Um, for example, in our current context, um, maybe they're starting to understand the reason why we need to quarantine when we're sick or come into contact with someone who has COVID. Um, they're able to move beyond thinking uh, about themselves and this sucks, I don't wanna stay inside, I wanna see my friends, I wanna go play. Um, and they start thinking, oh, this is to keep my family safe. Um, so they're able to move outside of themselves and think about maybe the well-being of others um, and their family and their community. Um, so this is really moving towards third order thinking. Um, and young people have the capacity to take it even further. Um, our hope for college age young adults is not only that they're connecting these concretes, um, finding meanings, but they're starting to connect the concepts behind those concrete things, find how the different meanings relate to one another. Um, and then they maybe start prioritizing the values um, that they're learning about. Um, what values are more important to me and um, to my family? Um, and this is where we start getting into fourth order, which disregard fourth order for now. It's where, you know, theology students and educators are supposed to be apparently. Um, but many of us, even in adulthood, um, stay in third order thinking. And sometimes we even fall back to second order thinking. Um, this isn't meant to be a static linear process at all, um, hence the circles within circles. Um, these ways of thinking are going to stay with us and continue to develop um, throughout our life. Um, so the, the goal is not to, not to confuse you with all this jargon, um, hopefully, but for you to see that there's, there's shifts going on um, in the ways that young people are thinking. Um, second to third order thinking, this is where adolescents and young adults have the potential to be, the potential to grow. Um, more likely than not, this is the space they're in, in that second order, moving to third order thinking. Um, so as ministers and as mentors, uh, we want to understand where individuals are at. So hopefully this kind of tool can show you where they may be in their thinking. And hopefully it can help us push um, adolescents and young adults towards um, that third order of thinking, being able to find connections behind practices, um, behind stories, behind concepts um, in their life and other people's lives. Um, this is how that uh, young adults can really start being able to think critically about concepts presented to them, um, especially when rules and beliefs they were told as a child from their parents are matching up to what they're experiencing in the rest of the world, um, whether they're at their friend's house, um, at school, at college, um, they can start beginning to understand um, that others may have different practices than them, um, let's say religiously or different ways of being hospitable. Um, but even with the differences, they can still have the same or similar reasons or values behind what they're doing. Um, there is that greater horizon that we're all moving towards. Um, and there is relationship and they're starting to recognize that relationship. So 
the next question becomes um, moving um, from the self to the world um, is how teens and young adults are finding a horizon in this stormy world that doesn't completely match up with the beliefs and rules they had growing up. How do they even begin to navigate that? Um, by stormy world, I am simply implying that there is a lot going on in our modern day world. Um, there's a ton of information being thrown at us every day, especially with the internet, the social media. Um, America is a pluralistic society. Um, there's a lot of diversity, a lot of cultures, a lot within politics, within schools. Um, there's so many messages and narratives out there that can make it confusing for an individual to find their place, um, to find their meaning. Uh, and they can often too easily get caught up in practices that the world is telling them it's cool, but it can actually be harmful to their well-being. So how do they, how do they navigate all that? Um, this is where the boating sailing mentor or metaphor <laughs> is really helpful again. Uh, remember, imagine the world as the water the individual is sailing through. The water's stable, but it's moving, always moving. Um, so how does the young person, the sailor, take in what is going on in the world, the waves, and interpret it? It really matters what the culture is saying to young people. Young people can take it in and normalize it easily. Um, just think of the college party culture, the fashion industry, the music industry, the economy, how much technology and social media is influencing them. And think of how much is this all really offering the young person about their horizon, their value, their meaning, their purpose. What narratives do provide meaning? What can be a helpful guide? This is where the community comes in. For we've learned that the adolescent does have the capacity to think um, deeper about meaning and purpose um, from those concentric circles I talked you through. Um, but we have to remember that teens and young adults can't do it on their own. As much as our individualistic society tells them that they can, the, the community has a really important role um, in helping the young person discern where they fit in with all of these new concepts being introduced to them every day. Um, the community can be the model and the inspiration for the way forward. And by community, I don't just mean family, I don't just mean class, it can be, um, it can be mentors from outside of the family, um, in school, in a faith community, a sports community, um, friends. Um, each has a unique insight into our world and all have narratives and practices um, which sustain our young people and give them meaning and move them forward. Um, so this is Fred Eddy. Um, he is an author and a part of a theological initiative at Duke Youth Academy. And he speaks of what a Christian community can provide. Um, my colleagues from my course and I um, would all say that the first thing a young person needs to experience is a loving, welcoming, and authentic community. Um, first things first. And the reason for this is to, to build trust, um, to build comfort uh, and openness. Um, to listening um, to what you have to offer um, as a mentor, as a minister. Um, what Fred Eddy then speaks about um, that I want to share with you is the need for, for balance, um, maybe even tension sometimes between what he calls pouring in and pouring out. Pouring in and drawing out, excuse me. Um, so we pour in the Christian narratives, for example, the teachings, the lessons from scripture, um, the stories, um, the sacraments. Um, but a Christian community can't just do that. They can't just pour in. They also must provide a means of interpreting these Christian stories within the context of the adolescents' own lives. 
You can't have the pouring in without the drawing out. Focusing too much on the pouring in leads to a dry faith narrative that isn't living tradition connected to these young lives of the faithful. And focus, focusing too much on the drawing out, which can happen as well, um, leads focusing too much on the context of their lives and not on the tradition um, can leave young people to being clever at pointing out injustices in our world, maybe, um, but they end up becoming way too cynical um, without the grounding foundation that a tradition can provide them. The Christian community has a lot to offer. Um, I mean, wow, I'm, I took a course on liturgy this semester um, and just the Catholic liturgy alone has so many rich pieces to offer. Um, and being an advocate for ecumenical and interreligious learning that I am, I'd argue that our other beloved traditions have a lot to author, offer our youth as well. Um, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for a youth to be a part of a community uh, that holds on to a rich tradition, a rich narrative, rich meaning, they have the opportunity um, to be guided towards a spiritual horizon of their own, uh, one that is shaped both by their community as well as their ways of thinking that are developing within them. They may not completely grasp it yet, but young people really do have the desire for meaning um, and capacity for learning these deep meanings that we're talking about today. Um, I hope you enjoy this little video of my friend and I dancing down the road uh, at a college service retreat toward the horizon um, as I dance our way towards the end of this presentation. Um, Juliana is present here today, so wave to her if you see her. Um, so I certainly recognize looking back on this, which is now five or six years ago, um, when I was a young adult at the beginning of college, I had that capacity for learning and understanding deep meaning. And I had the desire for it um, in my faith, myself, my lives, my peers, my community. But yet I do know now that I would not have been able to do that without the community of friends, the professors, the coworkers, the chaplains, that I had around me in the community that was Nazareth College. So let's talk about our role um, because we know the role of community is important, a good mentoring community. We have an important role um, to help young people shape and interpret their lives, their horizon. So let us not shortchange young people or remain on the surface. Uh, we know they're capable of thinking of deep concepts um, the development of the brain tells us so. Uh, so we don't need to dumb it down for teens or young adults. Um, for as you know, um, there's something about young people that can, especially teenagers and young adults, uh, they can sense hypocrisy about a mile away, I think. <laughs> um, and I'd blame that on all that hyperplasticity going on in their brain. So we can't be afraid to push them into drawing deeper meaning out of concepts. Um, you know how satisfied they'll be with the non-answer. Um, I'm sure we all still get frustrated with the non-answers. Oh, that's just the way it is, or because I said so. Um, we need to keep encouraging each other um, to ask those deeper questions, um, to draw out deeper meanings in why we do things. Um, for we're still navigating adulthood ourselves along with these kids and these young adults. We're all seeking to find meaning. So I wanna show you one more set of concentric circles before I leave you. Um, and this one may remind you of the subject object theory I was talking about earlier. Um, this is how we can help adolescents start to make sense out of things. Um, First, we begin with those concrete practices in the middle. Um, here's my cursor. So if you're within the Catholic Church like me, uh, maybe this means uh, teaching the mechanics of how liturgy works, um, of what a sacrament is, um, how to do reconciliation. Um, you give instructions, they're able to follow. 
Um, but then you need to move beyond that. Um, you really do. You need to pull the value out of those practices that you're teaching about. Um, you need to teach and show that there is value and meaning behind these practices that we're doing. Um, otherwise, why bother? Forget it, right? Um, this is dumb. <laughs> and then comes introducing the ideologies. Oops, oops, oops. Um, so maybe you can teach them a broader theological vision behind the value, um, how the value connects to the greater Christian tradition, for example. Um, this all prepares the adolescents' hearts and minds for connecting to an understanding of what's ultimate, their spiritual horizon. So this all flows nicely with that other set of concentric circles of how they're um, growing in their thinking. Um, because this is how their brain is developing. Um, this is the process of how they're learning and understanding um, throughout their adolescence, throughout their young adulthood. And this is what we need to keep in mind. Um, so let us, within our own respective communities, find ways that we can communicate authentically our own rich traditions that we have to offer uh, within our own spiritual horizons. Um, and let us seek to help young people in interpreting their own horizon so that they can be in greater loving communion with themselves, with the world, and with the divine. So I want to close with this great quote from Teresa O'Keefe's book, um, Navigating Towards Adulthood, about community. As God is communion, so the adolescent is called into communion, into relationship with others and with God, so as to discover her personhood. The community, through its many practices, trains the adolescent how to be in communion, how to love God and neighbor as himself. It trains her to open her eyes, to see her life and the world as gift given freely. The community in its practices teaches her to open her heart and risk giving herself compassionately to the other. The community models the truth that we are never perfected, never free of mistakes, but always open to greater grace. So here's some resources for the reading um, that I'd be happy to share with all of you that are all great resources for this kind of stuff. And I thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we are now gonna have some, a chance to think about this together in small groups. And um, I need just a second, I guess. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, we're gonna take some time for small group discussions. The, there'll be a prompt on your screen asking you to join a breakout room. We'll have about 12 minutes in these breakout rooms to discuss in small groups uh, some of the ideas that Sierra just um, introduced to us. And there'll be no appointed facilitators in your room. So once you're all present, feel free to unmute yourself and begin sharing with one another, okay? When the discussion time is over, you'll see a countdown timer on your screen. It'll go from 30 seconds. And after that runs out, you'll automatically rejoin the large group. So also, um, Sierra left us with some questions and I have entered them into the chat function. So um, there are three questions there. If once you get into your small group, what you can do to keep these questions in front of you is press chat once you get into the group and it'll show up, um, you'll be able to read it there. But before we go into the small group, um, I'll read the questions for you now too, okay? Question number one, think of a young person in your own life that you mentor. Can you recognize any shifts in them from second order to third order thinking? So for instance, going from thinking about things concretely to being able to draw meaning out of concepts. The second question, even though many of us aren't teenagers anymore, we still need a spiritual horizon to guide us. We're always learning and growing even into adulthood and we need meaning and purpose to move us forward. 
what has been your spiritual horizon? And question number three, think of your own faith or spiritual community or a community that you are a part of that means a lot to you. What practices or teachings does your community offer that can help young people navigate the world, help them shape their horizon? So again, once you get into your small groups, just press chat on the bottom of your screen if you're using a computer and those questions will pop up for you there. Okay, you should see a prompt to join a small group. Am I joining a group too, Andrea? If you want to. All right. <laughs> If you happen to be in this room and you would like to be in a small group, let me know. Otherwise you're welcome to, um, to not join. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. You all came back at once, so that must have meant that the conversations were good. <laughs> Nobody wanted to leave early. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, as we come back together, uh, we, all, we have time for some questions and um, comments from the group. But first, I would like us to uh, wait a minute and um, so we can do a translation. Mm -hmm. So just give me one second while I set this up. I tried to do this ahead of time, but I couldn't. <laughs> okay. All right. So on the bottom of your screen, you will see a, a circle. It says interpretation. It looks kind of like a globe. Now we all need to participate in this for it to work. So go down, no matter what language you speak, go down to um, the icon row on your screen if you're on a computer. If you're on an iPad, you can maybe find it by tapping your screen. Click interpretation and then choose the language in which you'd like to hear the questions on the rest of the, um, our time together in, okay? So there's English, Japanese, and Spanish options. Okay. Has everybody had a chance to do that? Yes? And, Andrea, do you have, uh, does that happen automatically or do you have translators? No, we, ha we have interpreters who are working with us, right? So it's, it's, it's a great function, but you still have to supply the people. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, now we're going to have time um, for about five people to share a comment or a question. Um, and to do that, please just physically, wave your hand in your screen. And I, when I see people um, who are ready to speak, I'll say your name. When you hear your name, feel free to unmute and share. Okay, so does anybody feel like they have a comment or a question? Bea, go ahead. Um, Sierra, I'm interested um, in your um, emphasis on the, on the community and I wonder if, if you would just comment on the um, sort of the phenomenon of spiritual but not religious and also the nuns and nuns movement. Oh, I accidentally muted you. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, big topic, right? Um, I actually just completed my final paper about this topic um, and how um, communities, um, faith communities can engage with the spiritual but not religious. Um, so I think, What's, what's really important is to remember that um, 
whether they're spiritually but not religious, unaffiliated, questioning, um, they're, they're still seeking meaning. And I think um, even if, um, even if they're not affiliated with a religion, um, communities can still offer insight, um, perspective, um, reflection, um, can help them engage with uh, practices that maybe are not in common, but can still um, allow the individual and the, the religious faith community um, can still allow both of them to, to reflect on values and meanings in their life. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, specifically Catholic or specifically um, Jewish. Um, I think like the important thing to remember is we're all, um, we're all seeking meaning in our lives. We're all seeking value. Um, and, um, you know, uh, spiritual and not spiritual people can uh, still be in conversation about those meanings. Um, so I think that's an important insight to remember. There's certainly a lot more to it than that, but that's my immediate response. Thank you, Bea. Really important question. Thanks. Okay, anybody else feel moved to ask a question or say a comment? I'm looking for some hands. Don't see any on this page. Oh, Carol Roloff, go ahead and unmute yourself and share. Uh, I, I have a question for you, Sarah. Um, I was very much impressed by the, the by the slide where you had different um, symbols for the different religions, because uh, you know there's um, you know Matthew Fox talks about there are many roads, but it's you know the same goal, and I think that's uh, you know that's there what you have it, and he emphasizes a lot about the indigenous people. And going back to the rituals that you know it's it's part of human being human so uh, my question to you is how did you come to this is this something that you learned or is this something that you grew into consciously because uh, you know i think youth uh, i think the whole world is becoming more conscious of of everybody in the world and that we're all one but I, I just am curious about people your age and how, how did you come to this? Um, this is where I, I really have to thank um, the Center for Spirituality at Nazareth College. Um, that's where I did my undergrad. Um, and also I think just um, the opportunity to do um, service and mission trips when I was a teenager um, and actually going out and seeing different communities different than my own and providing service and seeking solidarity with them. Um, but I think, yeah, being in an environment, um, the Center for Spirituality at Nazareth, um, they, they have all the different faith communities, but they're also really focused on interfaith dialogue. And I, being who I was, I, I loved learning new things, um, you know, hint to that uh, prefrontal cortex thing. Um, but I, I loved learning things and interfaith dialogue was an opportunity for to learn more and to appreciate the other, to learn more about myself in the process. Um, a lot of huge thanks to, to the Center for Spirituality and the chaplains there who really kind of um, broadened my vision even more to the importance of um, understanding and getting to know the other um, and seeing the value in their, um, in their own practices. Um, and yeah, um, I'm glad you brought up the um, indigenous peoples, Native American peoples too, um, because it, yeah, it really shows um, our roots as people, as um, we are a ritualistic people, we are a community of people. Um, and I think it's out there for young people to see and to recognize um, because the world is so, we have so much information, we can learn so much, um, but do really stress the need for um, young people to have mentors to, to guide them into being able to interpret and reflect on and make meaning um, of all these, these different things in our world. Um, but yeah, thank you, Carol, for your question. Thank you for your great answer. <laughs> I know I said five, but we're at eight o'clock. I'm so sorry. I see um, 
I think we're going to have to leave it here. And if you have more comments or questions, um, please include them on your evaluation. But I'd like to give uh, Sierra the last word and a chance to, um, to end with a prayer. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you so much for, for all of your presence. Um, it, was, it was such a joy to be with you and to share with you just um, a little bit of what I've been learning. And um, yeah, I hope we can all continue engaging um, in this learning, this process of navigating um, this crazy adulthood that is. Um, so let us close in prayer by remembering that we're in the holy presence of God. And let us always strive to love God and the dear neighbor without distinction. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this time together as community, as friends, um, to explore, um, explore you, your wisdom, um, and the wisdom that the community offers us um, and helps us and young people grow. Um, may you continue to be with us in our learning and our growing um, as we navigate um, adulthood um, and help young ones navigate um, into adulthood and um, continue to be with us uh, through this pandemic. Um, we pray for a swift end to it, um, uh, for the safety, health, and recovery um, of all who are suffering, each in their own way. And for all the students who are uh, finishing up finals, um, their semesters, um, teachers, um, for all those who mentor. For all this, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sarah. We're so lucky that you were with us tonight. Hooray. Good luck on your finals. Everybody feel free to unmute and say good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 What a yeah. joy to see everybody. Hello, Mary. Thank you. 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 Thank you.